Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of the Liberty Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Patrick McFarlane. This one is episode 220. Show notes may be found at libertyweekly.net forward slash 220. And joining me for this week is the managing editor of the Libertarian Institute and a longtime friend of the show, Keith Knight. How's it going, man? No complaints, brother. Still celebrating the LPMC victory that occurred in Reno. I'm watching the Reason Magazine interviews by Nick Gillespie with people like uh, Michael Heiss and Jeremy Kaufman, Scott Horton, Tom Woods, and I absolutely love it, dude. So I'm so grateful and uh, especially happy to uh, be discussing one of my favorite articles today. Hell yeah, man. And so ju- just for clarification, there's there's a bunch of Nick Gillespie interviews with all those figures because I, I only... I didn't even watch the 30 minute long documentary, which I understand is pretty even handed. Well, it's even handed considering we're expecting like the worst of the worst, the obvious uh, fall when it comes to Gillespie's interviewing style is he pushes the LPMC actors, Kaufman, Woods, Heiss, Angela McArdle. And that's good for us in the sense that it makes us stronger than we otherwise would be if we were not met with such, you know, pushback. But of course, we don't see any of it. Maybe we will see. And dude, I will be so happy to be wrong about this. But he also interviews Sarwark and just softball central with a few uh, questions he asked Sarwark. So when Sarwark says, we shouldn't be a meaner Republican party. Okay, meaner Republican. That would be, um, we don't care about the 17.5% tariff and the quotas that are causing the current baby, of baby formula shortages. Screw the babies. That's what I'm thinking, more evil Republican. Or let's kill more civilians in war. Uh, is that what you're talking about? Because that, while I agree, we don't need a meaner Republican party. That has nothing to do with the people who want to abolish the Federal Reserve and the drug war, and the regulatory state, and 50 other things that Republicans never even mention in the first place. So in that sense, it's totally ridiculous. But that just goes to show you there's no such thing as unbiased reporting. Everything is selective. Well, you know what, Keith, if you say mean things while you want to take away all the evil things that the state does, the evilest things, then that makes you worse than the Republicans who endorse all them. I know, really. It, it's like it's like that evil uh, Julian Assange for telling us about the war crimes. How dare he? Gosh, I, I, I really hope they give him the death penalty. Uh, now, the, the people who committed the crimes? Uh, gosh, get, give them purple stars and, uh, and all the other things you put on the costume. It's Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning. That's who we got to put in jail. Um, of course, uh, everything is uh, t- totally backwards. And, um, and that's why Sarwar perfectly represented the, uh, the status quo, if you will, because he was punishing all the wrong people and rewarding all the wrong people, even in Arizona when he was here. He was like, John McCain has passed away. Many Americans, as well as Arizonans, looked up to him. His passing, his absence will be felt. That's his bio of a mass murder advocate who legitimized statism as much as anyone else. So, I mean, that it's just, that was so bad for so long that I'm very appreciative. I keep telling myself I'm not going to mention that prick ever again, but then he keeps coming to the front of my mind. So last time, very last time. And, and you heard it here last time on Liberty Weekly. <laughs> so so um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about this, uh, this piece, The Reluctant Anarchist by Joe Sobran. Um, but I, I wanted to say we're going to be at Freedom Fest in, uh, in July, too. I think I just want to make sure we make that announcement, you know, so people can go get tickets. Exactly. And use code code. God, I think it's Horton 50 to get $50 off your Freedom Fest ticket. Yeah, so we're really looking forward to being there, seeing everybody. I think Dave is going to be there. Scott's going to be there. uh, Laundry, Kennedy will be there. A whole bunch of other people too. So looking forward to that. Certainly. Um, Okay, so I think our plan is then, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, we're going to read through this article and then we're going to comment on it at the end. So, of course, yeah. This uh, th- this is a, uh, a a gem. This is a gentleman named Joe Sobern. I'm just reading from his bio here on Sobern.com. In 1972, 
he went to work for National Review Magazine, beginning what would be a 21-year stint, including 18 years as senior editor. This is Bill Buckley's magazine. This is one of the great uh, conservative heroes that is constantly referenced in the right-wing circles. So to see that this guy is writing an article, The Reluctant Anarchist, is just so liberating. I uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, this came out in uh, December of 2002. So he begins, uh, my arrival very recently at philosophical anarchism has disturbed some of my conservative and Christian friends. In fact, it surprises me going as it does against my own inclinations. As a child, I acquired a deep respect for authority and a horror of chaos. In my case, the two things were blended by the uncertainty of my existence after my parents divorced, and I bounced from one home to another for several years, often living with strangers. A stable authority was something that I yearned for. Meanwhile, my public school education imbued me with the sort of patriotism encouraged in all children in those days. I grew up feeling that if there was one thing I could trust and rely on, it was my government. I knew it was strong and benign, even if I didn't know much else about it. The idea that some people, communists, for example, might want to overthrow the government filled me with horror. G.K. Chesterton, with his usual gentle audacity, once criticized Rudyard Kipling for his, quote, lack of patriotism. Since Kipling was renowned for glorifying the British Empire, this might have seemed one of Chesterton's paradoxes, but it was no such thing except in the sense that it denied what most readers thought was obvious and incontrovertible. Chesterton, himself a little Englander and opponent of empire, explained what was wrong with Kipling's view. Quote, he admires England, but he does not love her, for we admire things with reasons, but love them without reason. He admires England because she is strong, not because she is English, which implies there would be nothing to love her for if she were weak. Of course, Chesterton was right. You love your country as you love your mother, simply because it is yours, not because of its superiority to others particularly superiority of power. This seems axiomatic to me now, but it startled me when I first read it. After all, I was an American, and American patriotism typically expresses itself in superlatives. America is the freest, the mightiest, the richest, in short, the greatest country in the world, with the greatest form of government, the most democratic. Maybe the poor Finns or Peruvians love their countries too, but heaven knows why. They have so little to be proud of, so few reasons. America is also the most envied country in the world. Don't all people secretly wish that they were Americans? And uh, should I pass the baton off to you here, Keith? Sure. That was the kind of patriotism instilled in me as a boy, and I was quite typical in this respect. It was the patriotism of supremacy. For one thing, America had never lost a war. I was even proud that America had created the atomic bomb. Providentially, it seemed just in time to crush the Japs. And this is why the Vietnam War was so bitterly frustrating. Not the dead, but the defeat. The end of history's great winning streak. As I grew up, my patriotism began to take another form, which it took me a long time to realize was in tension with the patriotism of power. I became a philosophical conservative with a strong libertarian streak. I believed in government, but it had to be limited government, confined to a few legitimate purposes, such as defense abroad and policing at home. These functions, and hardly any others, I accepted under the influence of writers like Ayn Rand and Henry Hazlitt, whose books I read in my college years. Though I disliked Rand's atheism at the time, I was irreligious, but not anti-religious, she had an odd appeal to my residual Catholicism. I had read enough Aquinas to respond to her Aristotelian mantras. Everything had to have its own nature and limitations, including the state. The idea of a state continually growing, knowing no boundaries, forever increasing its claims on the citizen, offended and frightened me. It could only end in tyranny. I was also powerfully drawn to Bill Buckley, an explicit Catholic who struck the same Aristotelian note. During his 1965 race for mayor in New York, 
he made a sublime promise to the voter. He offered, quote, the internal composure that comes of knowing there are rational limits to politics. This may have been the most futile campaign promise of all time, but it would have won my vote. It was really this Aristotelian sense of rational limits rather than any particular doctrine that made me a conservative. I rejoice to find it in certain English writers who were remote from American conservatism. Chesterton, of course, Samuel Johnson, Edmund Burke, George Orwell, C.S. Lewis, Michael Oakeshott. In fact, I much preferred a literary, a literary contemplative conservatism to the activist sort that was preoccupied with immediate political issues. During the Reagan years, which I expected to find exciting, I found myself bored to death by supply-side economics, enterprise zones, privatizing welfare programs, and similar principle-dodging gimmickry. I failed to see what movement conservatives were less interested in principles than in Republican victories to the extent that I did see it, I failed to grasp what it meant. Patrick. Still, the last thing I expected to become was an anarchist. For many years, I didn't even know that serious philosophical anarchists existed. I'd never heard of Lysander Spooner or Murray Rothbard. How could society survive at all without a state? Now I began to be critical of the U.S. government, though not very. I saw that the welfare state, chiefly the legacy of FDR's New Deal, violated the principles of limited government and would eventually have to go. But I agreed with other conservatives that in the meantime, the urgent global threat of communism had to be stopped. Since I viewed defense as one of the proper tasks of government, I thought of the Cold War as a necessity, the overhead, so to speak, of freedom. If the Soviet threat ever ceased, the prospects seemed remote, we could afford to slash the military budget and get back to the job of dismantling the welfare state. Somewhere at the rainbow's end, America would return to her founding principles. The federal government would be shrunk, laws would be few, taxes minimal. That was what I thought, hoped anyways. I avidly read conservative and free market literature during those years with the sense that I was as a sort of late convert, catching up with the conservative movement. I took it for granted that other conservatives had already read the same books and had taken them to heart. Surely we all wanted the same things. At bottom, the knowledge that there were rational limits to politics. Good old Aristotle. At the time, it seemed a short hop from Aristotle to Barry Goldwater. As is fairly well known by now, I went to work as a young man for Buckley at National Review and later became a syndicated columnist. I found my niche in conservative journalism as a critic of liberal distortions of the U.S. Constitution, particularly in the Supreme Court's rulings on abortion, pornography, and freedom of expression. I'll just do another paragraph here. Uh, gradually, I came to see that the conservative challenge to liberal, uh, liberalism's jurisprudence of, quote, loose construction was far too narrow. Nearly everything liberals wanted the federal government to do was unconstitutional. The key to it all, I thought, was the Tenth Amendment, which forbid, forbids the federal government to exercise any powers not specifically de, uh, delegated to it in the, by the Constitution. But the Tenth Amendment had been comatose since the New Deal when Roosevelt's court virtually excised it. This meant that nearly all federal legislation from the New Deal to the Great Society and beyond, had been unconstitutional. Instead of fighting liberal programs piecemeal, conservatives could undermine the whole lot of them by reviving the true, and really obvious, meaning of the Constitution. Liberalism depended on a long series of usurpations of power. Around the time of Judge Robert Bork's bitterly contested and defeated nomination to the U.S. Supreme Court, conservatives spent a lot of energy arguing about the, quote, original intent of the Constitution must be conclusive, but they applied this principle only to a few ambiguous phrases and passages that bore on specific hot issues of the day, the, Beth the death penalty, for instance. About the general meaning of the Constitution, there could, I thought, be no doubt at all. The ruling principle is that whatever the federal government isn't authorized to do, it's forbidden to do. That alone would 
invalidate the federal welfare state and, in fact, nearly all liberal legislation. But I found it hard to persuade most conservatives of this. Bork himself took the view that the Tenth Amendment was unenforceable. If he was right, then the whole Constitution was in vain from the start. I never thought a constitutional renaissance would be easy, but I did think it could play an indispensable role in subverting the legitimacy of liberalism. Most most conservatives listened politely to my arguments, but without much enthusiasm, they regarded appeals to the Constitution as rather pedantic and, as a practical matter, futile, not much help in the political struggle. Most Americans no longer even remembered what usurpation meant. Conservatives themselves hardly knew. Of course, they were right in an obvious sense. Even conservative courts, if they could be captured, wouldn't be bold enough to throw out the entire liberal legacy at once. But I remain convinced that the conservative movement had to attack liberalism at its constitutional root. Patrick. In a way, I had transferred my patriotism from America as it then was to America as it had been when it still honored the Constitution. And when had it crossed the line? At first, I thought the great corruption had occurred when FDR subverted the federal judiciary. Later, I came to see that the decisive event had been the Civil War, which had effectively destroyed the right of the states to secede from the Union. But this was very much a minority view among conservatives, particularly at National Review, where I was the only one who held it. And before I forget, he's wrong. It actually happened with Judicial Review itself in the 1700s. Anyways, um, we'll get to that later. I've written more than enough about my career at the magazine, so I'll confine myself to saying that it was only toward the end of more than two happy decades there that I began to realize that we didn't all want the same things after all. And when it happened, it was like learning after long and placid marriage that your spouse is in love with someone else and has been all along. Not that I was betrayed, I was merely blind. I have no one to blame but myself. The Buckley crowd and the conservative movement in general no more tried to deceive me than I tried to deceive them. We all assumed we were on the same side when we weren't. If there's any fault for this misunderstanding, it is my own. In the late 1980s, I began mixing with Rothbardian and libertarians. They called themselves by the unprepossessing label anarcho-capitalists. And even met Rothbard himself. They were a brilliant combative lot full of challenging ideas and surprising arguments. Rothbard himself combined a profound theoretical intelligence with a deep knowledge of history. His magnum opus, Man, Economy, and State, had received the most unqualified praise of the usually reserved reserved Henry Hazlitt in National Review, no less. I can only say of Murray what so many others have said. Never in my life have I encountered such an original and vigorous mind, a short, stocky New York Jew with an explosive cackling laugh. He was always exciting and cheerful company, pouring out dozens of big books and hundreds of articles. He also found time, heaven knows how, to write on the old electric typewriter he used used to the end, countless long single space closely reasoned letters to all sorts of people murray's view of politics was shockingly blunt the state was nothing but a criminal gang writ large much as i agreed with him in general and fascinating though i found his arguments i resisted this conclusion i still wanted to believe in constitutional government murray would have none of this he insisted that the philadelphia convention at which the constitution had been drafted was nothing but a coup d'etat centralizing power and destroying the far more tolerable arrangements of the Articles of Confederation. This was a direct denial of everything I'd been taught. I'd never heard anyone suggest that the Articles had been preferable to the Constitution, but Murray didn't care what anyone thought or what everyone thought. He'd been too radical for Ayn Rand, for instance. Uh, Murray and I shared a love of gangster films, and he once argued to me that the mafia was preferable to the state because it survived by providing services people actually wanted. I countered that the mafia behaved like the state, extorting its own taxes in protection rackets, directed at shop, shopkeepers. Its market was far from free. He admitted I had a point, and I was proud to have won a concession from him. Keith. Murray died a few years ago without quite having made an anarchist 
of me. It was left to his brilliant disciple, Hans Hermann Hoppe, to finish my conversion. Hans argued that no constitution could restrain the state. Once its monopoly of force was granted legitimacy, constitutional limits became mere fictions it could disregard. Nobody could have the legal standing to enforce those limits. The state itself would decide by force what the Constitution, quote, meant, steadily ruling in its own favor and increasing its own power. This was a true a priori, and American history bore it out. What if the federal government grossly violated the Constitution? Could states withdraw from the Union? Lincoln said no. The Union was indissoluble unless all the states agreed to dissolve it. As a practical matter, the Civil War settled that. The United States, plural, were really a single enormous state as witness to the new habit of speaking of it rather than them. So the people are bound to obey the government even when the rulers betray their oath to uphold the Constitution. The door to escape is barred. Lincoln, in effect, claimed that it was not our rights, but the state that is unalienable. And he made it stick by force of arms. No transgression of the Constitution can impair the Union's inherited legitimacy. Once established, on specific and limited terms, the U.S. government is forever, even if it refuses to abide by those terms. As Hoppe argues, this is the flaw in thinking. The state can be controlled by a constitution. Once granted state power naturally becomes absolute. Obedience is a one-way street. Notionally, we, the people, create a government and specify the powers it is allowed to exercise over us. Our rulers swear before God that they will respect the limits we impose on them. But when they trample down those limits, our duties to obey them remains. Yet, even after the Civil War, certain scruples survived for a while. Americans still agreed in principle that the federal government could acquire new powers only by constitutional amendment. Hence, the post-war amendments included the words, Congress shall have the power to enact such legislation. But by the time of the New Deal, such scruples were all but defunct. Franklin Roosevelt and his Supreme Court interpreted the Commerce Clause so broadly as to, author as to authorize virtually any federal claim and the Tenth Amendment so narrowly as to deprive it of any inhibiting force. Today, these heresies are so firmly entrenched that Congress rarely even asks itself whether a proposed law is authorized or forbidden by the Constitution. In short, the U.S. Congress, the U.S. Constitution is a dead letter. It was mortally wounded in 1865. The corpse can't be revived. This remained hard for me to admit, and even now, it pains me to say. Patrick. Other things have helped change my mind. R.J. Rummel of the University of Hawaii calculates that in the 20th century alone, states murdered about 162 million of their own subjects. This figure doesn't include the tens of millions of foreigners they killed in war. How then can we speak of states protecting their people? No amount of private crime could have claimed such a toll. As for warfare, Paul F uh, Fussell's book, Wartime, portrays battle with such horrifying vividness that although this wasn't its intention, I came to doubt whether any war could be justified at all. My fellow Christians have argued that the state's authority is divinely given. They cite Christ's injunction, quote, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and St. Paul's words, quote, the powers that be are ordained of God. But Christ didn't say which things, if any, belong to Caesar. His ambiguous words are far from a command to give Caesar whatever he claims. And it's notable that Christ never told his disciples either to establish a state or to engage in politics. They were to preach the gospel and, if rejected, to move on. He seems never to have imagined the state as something they could or should enlist on their side. 
At first sight, St. Paul seems to be more positive in affirming the authority of the state, but he himself, like the other martyrs, died for defying the state, and we honor him for it, to which we may add that he was on one occasion a jailbreaker as well. Evidently, the passage in Romans has been misread. It was probably written during the reign of Nero, not the most edifying of rulers, but then Paul also counseled slaves to obey their masters, and nobody construes this as an endorsement of slavery. He may have meant that the state and slavery were here for the foreseeable future and that Christians must abide them for the sake of peace. Never does he say that either is here forever. St. Augustine took a dim view of the state as a punishment for sin. He said that a state without justice is nothing but a gang of robbers writ large, while leaving doubt that any state could ever be otherwise. St. Thomas Aquinas took a more benign view, arguing that the state would be necessary even if man had never fallen from grace, but he agreed with Augustine that a, an unjust law is no law at all, a doctrine that would severely diminish any known state. The essence of the state is a legal monopoly of force, but force is subhuman. In words I quote incessantly, Simone Weil defined it as, quote, that which turns a person into a thing, either corpse or slave. It may sometimes be a necessary evil in self-defense or defense of the innocent, but nobody can have by right what the state claims an exclusive privilege of using it. It's entirely possible that states organized force will always rule this world and that we will have at best a choice among evils. And some states are worse than others in important ways. Anyone in his right mind would prefer living in the United States to a life under Stalin. But to say a thing is inevitable or less onerous than something else is not to say it is good. For most people, anarchy is a disturbing word suggesting chaos, violence, antinomianism, things they hope the state can control or prevent. The term state, despite its bloody history, doesn't disturb them. Yet, it's the state that is truly chaotic because it means the rule of the strong and cunning. They imagine that anarchy would naturally terminate in the rule of thugs, but mere thugs can't assert a plausible right to rule. Only the state with its propaganda apparatus can do that. That is what legitimacy means. Anarchists obviously need a more seductive label keith but what would you replace it with the question reveals an inability to imagine human society without a state yet it would seem that an institution that can take 200 million lives within a century within a century hardly needs to be replaced christians and especially americans have long been misled about all this by their good fortune. Since the conversion of Rome, most Western rulers have been more or less inhibited by Christian morality, though often enough, not so's you'd notice. And even welfare became somewhat civilized for centuries, and this has bred the assumption that the state isn't necessarily an evil at all. But as that morality loses its cultural grip as it rapidly as it's rapidly doing this confusion will dissipate more and more we can expect the state to show its nature nakedly for me this is anything but a happy conclusion i miss the serenity of believing i lived under a good government wisely designed and benevolent in its operation but as St. Paul says, there comes a time to put away childish things. Joe Sobrin, December 2002. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the portion of the show where I tell you how you can help support this content. It is at my new membership website, libertyweekly.club. And I know I've been announcing this, but uh, I left Substack, rolled out a new membership website that operates the same way you get content through your email address, but there's also a web page, libertyweekly.club, where you can go and read the articles. And uh, it works really great so far. Uh, just a couple of hiccups in terms of trying to figure out how to use um, you know, free previews for people who are just signed up to the free newsletter. Um, and for people who sign up through the membership here, you can see that Right now, I have a $5 a month tier that will get you access to um, early access to episodes of Liberty Weekly, 
access to bonus episodes that I've been trying to come out with two times a month, uh, preprint access to all my Libertarian Institute articles before they're published, and I'm working on setting up a subscribers-only live stream. I'd like to do that before the end of the month, um, which I will announce through through the email list. So if you go through, sign up for the email list, libertyweekly.club, hit the subscribe button. You can choose the free tier or you can choose the $5 per month tier, which will get you access to the benefits. Uh, but for free content, there there still is uh, free content up there. Like uh, I, I do a lot of article content there. So um, head on over to libertyweekly.club. The other thing that I'm really excited to announce is a collaboration between myself and Ludwig von Mises Pieces, which is uh, the guy who does all my graphics and thumbnails and the guy who, I mean, he does a ton of awesome work. So you can see Liberty Weekly merch is now available. If you head on over to libertyweekly.net this time forward slash uh, merch, M-E-R-C-H, you'll be able to find Liberty Weekly merch with my new logo with the rising sun and Lady Liberty holding the shield and flag. Uh, I really like the logo that he was able to do for me. And uh, you can see that you can get coffee mugs there. You can get sweatshirt. Um, you can get t-shirts and all that kind of stuff. The other collaboration. Oh, and if you use promo code LW10, that will get you 10% off. And it will also get a kickback to me and uh, show him that you bought through my link. But you could also go through all the other merchandise that he has there. Uh, there's lots of good stuff. You buy anything in the store with promo code LW10, and uh, I will also get a kickback. You can see a bunch of stickers and T-shirts and designs that people in our sphere of the liberty in uh, the liberty movement will just love all that, uh, the merch that he has there. It's original stuff that he's made himself. And we did a collaboration on a T-shirt that idea that I had um, dissolve NATO, super timely right now. But for those of you just listening to the audio version only, it's uh, the NATO logo that is being shattered into a million pieces, and it says dissolve NATO on it. So I think it's a really cool, timely T-shirt. Uh, of course, it was uh, an idea that I'd commissioned, and I think that he did an awesome job with it. And if you like my thumbnails and logo art, um, you know, Ludwig von Mises pieces did, uh, why I am anti-war podcast logo, which is a dove coming out of a helmet. And I really, really, uh, like that logo too. So check out this dissolve NATO. You can get it in sticker format. You can get it on a sweatshirt or a t-shirt. And, uh, I'm going to be picking some of these up myself because I think they turned out really awesome. So, uh, again, head on over to libertyweekly.net forward slash merch. And to get the NATO t-shirt, head on over to libertyweekly.net forward slash NATO, N-A-T-O. All right, so um, that's all the stuff I got for you guys this week. Uh, thanks, everyone, for subscribing. All the members at libertyweekly.club, really appreciate it. You really help me um, afford all the, the hosting costs and to upgrade my equipment and all that kind of stuff, too. So, all right. Thanks. Peace. So initial thoughts, Keith. I mean, for me, this is an, this is an article. It's a piece that I've actually tried to write myself, a very similar piece, kind of tracking the guideposts on my way of thinking from conservatism to libertarianism to libertarian anarcho-capitalism. What do you think? I love it. I absolutely love it. I mean, it's, it, it was hard enough for me to go from supporting Mitt Romney in 2012. I was interested in Ron Paul and I attended his, uh, his debate after party in Arizona when there was a big Republican convention in Arizona. And I ended up supporting Romney. I read his book, No Apology. I was really big on that. The big things that come out to me is that uh, he loved the personality of Murray Rothbard and the stance position and the uh, staunch position rather of Hans Hermann Hoppe. So it was their personalities that made him much more likely to accept the conclusions that these people held about the state. It was their consistency in saying that you believe in this constitution because it gives you this effect. Well, this effect that you claim to want is not necessarily coming from this constitution. So they were simply taking Sobrin's premise 
and saying, yeah, we agree on this premise, but this conclusion of therefore we should have a Supreme Court that has the unilateral ability to interpret the meaning of this document, it doesn't necessarily follow. So in doing so, they weren't stripping Sobrin, or any one of us rather, uh, they weren't stripping them of their identity, but merely taking their identity and say, I think this leads somewhere else and showing them that it gives them the ability to grow rather than stay stagnant. He mentions he was bored with the, uh, the, with the Reagan years. So uh, I got so much joy out of this. And it's, it, it's so inspiring to see that someone who worked as senior editor for 18 years I mean, gosh, I worked at Walmart for like two or three, and I, I will defend that place until I die because I loved it so much. I spent so much time. I can't imagine senior editor, 18 years, and he was able to not necessarily throw that away, but say these premises that we hold so true, so vital, so valuable, uh, they're really important, but I think they give us a different conclusion. That's why this is one of my uh, favorite uh, articles ever. I think one thing I really identified with it was the kind of filling in what your conclusions have to be. So if you come to the conclusion that the state is illegitimate, then you have to at some point tackle the constitution. And for someone who's a constitutional conservative, that, you know, this is something that, I mean, even if you're a Democrat or, or a liberal or something like that, the, the constitution is something that you deify to a certain sense. Um, maybe if you're, I don't know, if you're a Democrat, you, you think that you, you project certain ideals upon it. You think that it's built to be an elastic document, but you still, you still put it on a pedestal of some sorts. If you're a conservatism, the constitution is the end all be all of everything like it was for me. And, um, once you, you know, realize the state's illegitimate, like I said, you have to tackle the constitution at some point in time. And there's a whole bunch of other things, other conclusions that you have to reach when you're going through this about history specifically. And all of these, the mythos that you learn through school and uh, through growing up through films, through films that were propagandizing you that you didn't even realize were propagandizing you or everything that your, your uncles or your family members or anyone ever said about the United States. You know, I, I distinctly remember being in, um, being in my elementary school cafeteria and having a conversation with, with one of my classmates. This was in elementary school, like I said, but he was saying that if it wasn't for World War II, we would all be speaking German right now. And, and that's something that you have to confront uh, one of the things that are so like ingrained this idea in the back of your mind from when you're growing up. And um, so going through and talking about the Civil War and what we learn about that and, and all these things that we as ANCAPs, I mean, we've grappled with on this show, uh, but that I know the audience has grappled with before too. Um, but it's really, there's no, in, in my I'd like to say that once you realize these things, there's no going back to your old mindset, but it seems like some of us are nowadays. I don't know what you think, Keith. Well, your time preference certainly changes as, as you age. So if you're, uh, I mean, uh, I get that I'm, you know, in my twenties now, but if I were much older and this was actually Ben Shapiro's point in 2016, where he's like, look, I really don't like Trump, but if you're in your 50s or 60s, you might just want to smash the Democrats and make it so, you know what, you've given the state so much power, here's Trump having that much power. I can get that. I'm younger, I would rather Hillary Clinton uh, get elected and then maybe get someone in opposition to her, and that would really rile up the base. So it all depends on how you're sort of uh, coming at this and uh, and at which time in your life. That's why I think it's so surprising that a guy like Joe Sobern can go on so many shows. You know, he was on like Hoover Institution and all these National Review friendly shows uh, promoting his ideas. And then to say, you know what? I think I came to the wrong conclusion. Uh, um, Tom Palmer said that uh, he saw F.A. Hayek do that at a speech once. And he was so impressed that it was so humbling that someone so smart, so articulate, could even admit that uh, that that he was wrong, 
that it uh, it really inspires you to say, you know what, that's the kind of person that uh, that, that I want to be. I want to be able to admit that I was wrong this way in the entire span of my life. Even if I'm at the end of it, I can say, you know what, I've been wrong a very long, <laughs> a very long amount of time. However, it's better to be on the right side, at least for some time in your entire existence, rather than uh, th- than not at all. Yeah. And I'm just trying to think, I'm thinking about the times that I've been wrong. <laughs> I can count them on one hand, Keith. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what? <laughs> um, I was actually asked that by the, uh, by a guy who was inducted into the national teachers hall of fame, a guy named Bob Fenster. I was asked, uh, I was asked that recently and I had mentioned a, a number of, uh, times that I was wrong, uh, before I had uh, become a voluntarist, so to speak. And even afterwards, there were things that I not necessarily was wrong about, but I didn't appreciate the depth of. So it's not that I had always said families shouldn't exist, but I didn't appreciate the depth of the family or the concept of a large number of people believing in the same, even if you think it's a myth, the, uh, the a shared belief that people have as a default mechanism. So before they trade, it's not like, you know, people say, well, what is your philosophy on life? It's like, look, you're waving that flag. I'm waving this flag. Uh, it's the same flag. We're going to be okay. We don't have to go to war with each other. So definitely having a uh, similar default mechanism, I thought was so, uh, I've learned rather, is so vitally important. So uh, that is mainly the, uh, the things I've learned recently. I'm thinking more about, you know, the underlying assumptions or, or the underlying principles being correct is that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning more and more, I don't know, pacifist, the more that I, I study war and, and war and morality and killing in war. Um, I had that episode with Lori Calhoun where we, we were talking about this, this idea as war, a just war being a defensive war. Well, even if you're engaging in war in self-defense, defense of your hometown and country, you're still going to inadvertently kill civilians. I mean, you're still, even if you're completely right that you're standing on your homestead as the Russian military, right? <laughs> or the Chinese, the Chai comms are rolling over the hills and you set up booby traps or landmines or something in advance. Well, you're going to kill civilians. I don't know if you, you've got a stray round that hits a civilian or something like that. Uh, I digress, but uh, you know, that's one thing I've been thinking about or, or I didn't think that that Putin was going to invade Ukraine. I, I think I was arguing against that possibility on this show. So there's a few things that I've been wrong about and, and, you know, who knows, I could be wrong about the, um, the Uyghur genocide stuff. I mean, all I'm just saying is that I don't see the evidence and, what's being presented, I don't believe. So um, yeah, anyways, but uh, was there anything else that kind of that you identified with in in this article? You know, I pretty much uh, said my piece on the uh, personality aspect that he was attracted to of Rothbard and Hoppe, the uh, consistency application and uh, not having to change his uh, his identity. It wasn't so threatening that he just ran away and said, Oh God, th- these are a bunch of kooks. I got, th- I'm in a network with, uh, w- with Bill Buckley. Uh, th- I mean, w- w- I got uh, so many friends to have. Why do I need to hang around, uh, uh, around these people? But he also mentioned Henry Hazlitt, which it's all about recognizing the costs of the things. Even Churchill in the opening of his book, the gathering storm said uh, it, it's, Uh, terrible that after um, all the victories of the righteous cause, we find ourselves in even worse perils than we did uh, previously. Now, that's me summarizing what he said. You can go uh, find the quote. It's in the preface of The Gathering Storm, part one of his six books on, uh, on the Second World War. But it's just getting in that habit of looking at also the costs of uh, of these wars. So as much as you hate the Taliban or Al Qaeda, uh, be careful before you wage a 20 year war on the Taliban because they might take over in 11 days, even if NATO declares war on them, not just the United States. So, uh, yeah, uh, all of that 
uh, I'm so appreciative of Hazlitt, Hoppe, Rothbard for being as unapologetic as they were in their application of these ideas to bring people like uh, Joe Soberin uh, over. Yeah, well, I, I think, um, I mean, there's a, a few more things we could kind of chew on here with uh, the Constitution or the conservative view of the Constitution, just anecdotally, like going through law school, I was I was the vice president of the Federalist Society, and there were three people out of the whole law school in the Federalist Society in my law school. And one of, I mean, I would kind of get into arguments with them because I didn't see it the same way as them in terms of the role of the constitution and my interpretation of it and, you know, supporting the articles of confederation over the constitution or the, my view of judicial review, which go back to episode two of this podcast. And I kind of covered that. Um, but it, you know, them wanting to like go back, but not that far back, you know, or, or something like that, or just having this traditional view of what the constitution is or, or, you know, not, not even really embracing what the founding fathers thought about it. And in the fact that, you know, if, if not every federalist member of the Federalist society knows about nullification and knows about the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, it's like, that should be constitution 101. And uh, if conservatives don't champion that, then right, there really is a schism there. Certainly. And it's, it, it differentiates between two types of prohibitions. So imagine the prohibition on alcohol versus the prohibition on government. Or you could say, or a, probably a better analogy is prohibition of capitalist acts uh, between consenting adults and prohibition of government. In one case, the capitalist acts, it's going to be nearly impossible, even in the Soviet Union, from East Germany to Vladivostok as they had control of all, uh, I guess it was Eastern Europe. I get those confused sometimes. Um, you still had a great range of voluntary exchanges and people constantly engaging in anarchistic acts. So in, in this sense, you're necessarily trying to outlaw each individual's personal interest. But in the sense of outlawing something like government or murder or rape, you necessarily have a, a an aggressor and a victim. So this is something that can reasonably be abolished because it's in each party's interest by definition. By definition, the capitalist act is consent, is, is consensual, and by definition, the statist act is without the consent of another. So until you understand things from that point of view, it seems very easy to embrace the idea of conservatism of uh, this one group is going to basically have a monopoly on enforcing all of this. Well, you see that they have no incentive. Whereas in the capitalist acts between consenting adults, you constantly have an incentive. So if you have a mass incentive, among hundreds of millions of people, well, there's going to be some sort of market. And maybe that's a gray market. Maybe that's a black market. Maybe it's going to be voluntary arbitration organizations that they're going to go to. But this is what I think gets at the root of the human nature aspect that we're so uh, often you know, uh, accused with. Well, human nature is bad. Well, if people are so bad, make sure there's no monopoly of enforcement that these bad people can uh, can occupy. So uh, I really like Sobrin's, mm, I don't want to say attack on the Constitution, because I think he would say that it was certainly a move in the right direction, much as he would say the Magna Carta was a move in the right direction. But I really like his, uh, his striving to make his own side better. It, it's almost like he's saying throughout this, it, it's not up to your standards to say, that this is okay. We clearly see Lincoln, and it's not just the slavery issue. Of course, you had the slave states in the North. I, uh, I Do you by any chance remember what they are? I'm sure you could quickly Google it, uh, the, the states in the North that had uh, slavery. But, but even, even if you don't recognize uh, forced cotton picking labor as slavery, you could still say that military conscription is the worst form of slavery that's around. I mean, everyone I ask who uh, 
who I trust to give me an honest answer, will say that they'd much rather be forced to pick cotton than fight a war against Kaiser Wilhelm. What a non-enemy Kaiser Wilhelm was in the First World War. Yet we lost 117,000 Americans in uh, in that uh, First World War conflict. So that's, I mean, that's like 30-something 9-11s that we lost in, uh, in that war alone. So uh, again, you're looking at not only the benefits, but the costs of these wars, and you're just not having a, uh, a, a double standard for, uh, for, for any entity. Were you able to, uh, to, to find the names of those four northern states? I'm looking, and I, I can't find it just offhand. I, I, I just don't it Missouri, have it. Ken- Missouri, Kentucky. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, I, I was just, uh, I mean, I was watching this documentary on um, World War One just the last couple nights, just as I'm going to bed. And like, I, the unimaginable, like, it's, it's just incomprehensible, the number, the, the, the nature and amount of violence that was occurring. And I, I just couldn't imagine going through that. And moreover, if something like that occurred today, um, I just feel like we're most people in the civilized world are so well, well, I don't want to say that I most people in the Western world in the modern developed countries are so far removed from violence um, that it just doesn't. I don't think people have any understanding of, of how bad it could actually get and I mean, for instance, like the situation in Ukraine right now, where, where comparatively to violence that has taken pla- taken place very recently in in the global South, everyone's all up in arms because these are you know white Europeans that are going through the situation. When comparatively, I mean, it's still terrible, but comparatively, it's just not not on par on the level of a lot of things that have been happening in you know uncivilized countries. If you go at Go off my my uh, mistake, my misspeak there. Well, and even Zelensky has uh, called for uh, basically martial law where he's collectivized the press and he's enforced conscription. I think it's like men ages 18 to 61, according to USA Today. It's something ridiculous, or maybe that was a civil war. It's like 18 to 50, the men cannot leave. So first of all, sexist. Second of all, slavery. I don't care if it's just towards one group or another. It's literal forced labor. Maybe they would rather take the bargain of living under a Yanukovych, a uh, guy's name was Viktor Yanukovych, uh, a Putin-friendly regime than the U.S. regime. What more do they have to lose than constantly getting uh, b- bombarded? The four states, by the way, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri. Those were the four slave states at the time during the Civil War. So it's not like it was slavery versus anti-slavery. It was also slavery in uh, in the North and slavery afterwards in the form of conscription. So (laughs) again, just it's much more about telling these people that think they're on such a moral high ground of, well, I'm anti-slavery and I'm so cool and I oppose the Civil War. Well. It was more than half a million deaths. So let's take that into account. Also, the North had slavery. Also, there was slavery up until the Vietnam War in in its worst form. So m- maybe just making them a little more insecure about their position is a uh, is a good way to go. I love uh, Prof. CJ's take in his like super long epic Civil War series with the Dangerous History podcast. Where like his his basic, uh, he, I think he disagrees with the take that the Civil War wasn't about slavery, right? I mean, you'll hear people in our circles say the Civil War wasn't about slavery; it was about states' rights and things like that, and you know the tariff of abominations and and that kind of stuff. And and like I think he has a qualified disagreement with that, where he'll say like, no, the truth of the Civil War is that politically it was like it was about power, right? And it was about, and, and slavery was an issue where the power butt heads. But he said, if you really look into it, both sides politically, politically, both the North 
North and the South acted and were motivated by the worst of intentions like think of the worst motivations that could have motivated that could have uh, inspired these two sides and uh that's what it was so yeah definitely and that is the position of gosh i forget his name randy mm, he wrote uh, the structure for liberty randy bennett bill uh, if you could look up the uh, the, the structure of Liberty. I just don't have the name. I know he's an attorney. He met with uh, Amy Coney Barrett and uh, Rand Paul. They had a, uh, a a good discussion from Randy Barnett. Well, Randy Barnett. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, his book is great because there's a summary at the end of each chapter, which allows non lawyers like me to really grasp what uh, what they're talking about. But he, he says there's a difference between why the North was willing to go to war and why the South was willing to go to war. He says, well, the North was willing to go to war to preserve the Union, as we know from Lincoln's letter to, I think his name was Horace Greeley, the founder of the New York uh, Tribune. He wrote this in a letter, if I could uh, save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do so, etc. And the reason uh in his first inaugural address was so long as they pay the moral tariff there will not be bloodshed so the reason the union goes to war is to preserve the union and the reason the south goes to war is to preserve slavery so they both had these different intentions there wasn't just one goal overall so you can uh, again see that this is two criminal gangs two governments of each area enslaving their own population, making them bear the cost for what uh, for what they want. The long of the short of this is governments are the enemy, not the people, just like we see. It's not the evil Ukrainians or the evil Russians versus the virtuous Ukrainians or the virtuous uh, Russians. It's just these criminal gangs that we have to get rid of by no longer recognizing their uh, the their right to um to, to have a totally different standard for how they operate whether it's taxation or conscription or regulation yeah and just a final note on that i think that if you if i'm not mistaken if you analyze the letters from both sides from the actual soldiers in some conscripts but some not like volunteers that were fighting for the south and the north they they, I mean, maybe people in the North talked about these damn rebels or something, but it seemed like people in the South were generally motivated by preserving their way of life, not slavery. Um, so, but uh, yeah, Keith, well, why don't you, uh, we can wrap this up here, but why don't you let everyone know where they can find your work? Odyssey.com, Keith Knight, don't tread on anyone, and libertarianinstitute.org, more, uh, but more importantly. Hell yeah. Well, libertyweekly.net for me, libertyweekly.club is my membership website. And there's a newsletter there that you can sign up for free. Um, and that's where you can find my work. So libertarianinstitute.org. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next week. Uh -huh.